president of the United States. He, he can do whatever he wants. Quite frankly, if you want to look good in a swimsuit, I don't feel any sympathy. Get in the gym and look good in a swimsuit. So you use Drake as a selling point to bring in over $100 million. I'm going to borrow, steal, and beg anything I can to help me to promote my city. Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin is slashing dental and vision benefits for around 460,000 people on Medicaid after a federal judge rejected his plan to impose a work requirement on beneficiaries. His administration says a shortfall in the state's Medicaid budget left it with no choice. That this will be a detriment to people, I think is a huge, huge misunderstanding. 27 of Poland's 72 Supreme Court justices are being forced out of their positions after the ruling Law and Justice Party lowered the retirement age to 65. It's the party's latest move to control the courts. It's also taken over the appointment of judges, installed its Minister of Justice in the previously independent role of Prosecutor General, and is expanding the court to 120 seats, meaning the party can choose nearly two-thirds of the court. Cardi B is the first female rapper ever to land two Billboard number one hits after her single, I Like It, reached the top spot this week. They call me Cardi B, I run this shit like Cardi Woo! The Trump administration will ask college admissions officers to ignore a student's race when considering their application. The move reverses Obama administration policies intended to help schools improve racial diversity. The Justice Department says those guidelines go beyond what the Supreme Court requires. The First Lady of Honduras visited a detention camp in McAllen, Texas on Monday to meet with families from her country who were detained under President Trump's zero tolerance policy. Hemos consultado sobre la implementación de la acción ejecutiva del presidente Trump, donde ordenó que ya no se siguieran separando las familias y constatar que en efecto las familias no están siendo separadas. Last year alone, 50,000 Hondurans were caught crossing into the U.S. And while news of Trump's new immigration strategy is making its way south, it's not much of a deterrent for people trying to reach a better life. As many as 250 deportees arrive every day at the airport in San Pedro Sula. Some of them are picked up by family members, others leave in taxis, but the bulk end up on a bus that takes them to a station about 10 minutes away. You can tell who they are, because most of them are wearing white t-shirts and carrying little green bags. So probably about three quarters of the people who landed on the plane, there were 93, were left here and now they're going inside here to the station. I'm going to follow them in and see if I can talk to one of them. Camila Oyuela was detained in April before the new policy took effect. People are fleeing Honduras because it's one of the poorest and most violent countries in Latin America. When someone decides to leave for the U.S., they often call a person like Alejandro, if they can afford it. He's been smuggling people out of Honduras for the Gulf Cartel for the last 11 years. He charges about $7,000 per person. And he says business is pretty good. We agreed to conceal his identity. No ha afectado, más bien ha favorecido, porque miles de personas deciden viajar más, porque dicen que es mentira. Es mentira que son propaganda falsa de muchos medios de comunicación para que para detener el paso migratorio. ¿A quién están ayudando a cruzar? A personas que quieren salir adelante, que no hayan más que hacer en este país, que a personas que ya no tienen nada. En Honduras está como muy liderado por lo que son las las gangas o pandillas y creo que esto ha generado como como aún más temor a que te separen de tu hijo. 
en Estados Unidos. ¿A cuántas personas has ayudado este año? Este año, creo que ya voy a llegar como a los 100 y algo. Tengo planes de salida para el sábado. ¿Con quién? Con mamás y un papá. ¿Niños? Sí, llevo niños. ¿Cuántas personas? Llevo ocho en total. ¿Le preguntan sobre el, eh, la política de separar a las familias? No piensan en eso, creo. Ellos no... Como que no les afecta mucho eso. Creo que es, es, tal vez en el interior de cada persona, ¿no? Sientan el temorcito, pero siempre hacen el viaje. ¿Crees que hay una política que existe que pueda parar a la gente de venir a los Estados Unidos de esta manera? Si el presidente Donald Trump decide levantar un muro que pegue al cielo, nosotros vamos a acabar un túnel que pegue al fondo de la tierra y que cruce Estados Unidos. On the outskirts of the city, at a popular first stop for those heading north without the help of people like Alejandro, we saw firsthand what he was talking about. People still ready to leave for the U.S. Henson Aranda Pineda has heard that the U.S. is jailing people who cross the border illegally, but it still hasn't changed his mind. Desde que uno sale aquí, ya uno toma el riesgo que le puede pasar en el camino, lo que puede suceder. ¿Cuál es el destino? Eh, me gustaría que se escucha bonito en Estados Unidos, Carolina del Norte, bonito. Yo lo he visto en televisión, es bonito, ¿me entiendes? Ahí, bonito. No, pero si en cualquier lugar de Estados Unidos, con tal que haya trabajo, uno pueda mandar algo para aquí, Honduras, y que su familia viva con unas comodidades un poquito mejor, eso es por el trabajo que te vas. Por trabajo, por violencia, por bueno, por muchas cosas que uno mira aquí en el país. Y si, si te cogen y te deportan. Se intenta de vuelta. Se intenta de vuelta. ¿Esta es la, la primera vez para, para usted? Mm, no. Ya, ya es la, la séptima vez. President Trump is in the process of interviewing candidates for the Supreme Court vacancy ahead of an announcement on Monday. We'll make a decision on the United States Supreme Court, the new justice that'll be made over the next few days, and we'll be announcing it on Monday. But the confirmation process won't be a layup. The GOP only has a one-seat margin in the Senate, and Republican Senator Susan Collins says she'll oppose any nominee hostile to Roe v. Wade which means that Trump may ultimately need support from red state Democrats running for re-election and under pressure to play ball. And the News Talk 730's KYYA's morning wake-up report. In our studio, Senator John Tester. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Scott. John Tester is a Democratic senator defending his seat in a state Donald Trump won. So he talks about Trump the way you'd expect from a red state Democrat. North Korea. Right. What do you want to see to come out of these talks? I applaud the effort by the president. I think that uh, this is exactly what needs to happen. But his votes are a different story. Compared to the rest of the top targeted Democrats, Tester doesn't seem to mind pissing the president off. He's voted for Trump's priorities less than 40% of the time. Tester's careful to frame himself as an independent. I mean, we've done our level best to make sure Montana is represented and rural America is represented in Washington, D.C., and, and make sure that Montana values have a place there and hold people accountable and, and not be afraid to stir the pot. And voters here seem to buy it. Senator John Tester has proven that he appreciates us both in talk and actions. You know what we appreciate? What's that? How you navigate being a moderate in a very polarized world. Yeah. People ask what, whether I'm Democrat or Republican. I tell him I'm a radical moderate. Tell him you're a Montana. No, That's I'm exactly. A radical moderate. <laughs> Let me get your picture, Dad. In a state where there's no party registration, Tester's banking that being a Montanan is more important to voters than his opposition to the president. And it's hard to find somebody more Montana than a guy who's still working on his century-old family farm. Oh, Jesus Christ, what was that? My grandfather came out here in 1910, and uh, he farmed it until uh, 1943 when my folks took it over. 
and they farmed it till 78, and Charlotte and I have been doing it since then. The average farm in eastern Montana is about 5,000 acres. We're about 1,800 acres. It's good, you know, we've had to add a little add a little income. We've got a butcher shop there on the other side of our three-stall garage. That's where I lost my fingers. You never get in a fight with power equipment, you know, and I got in a fight with a meat grinder. Yeah, uh, you went back to the meat grinder, right? You still... You we still, still use, I that. still use that meat grinder, yeah. Tester plays up these Montana roots in his campaign while attacking his Republican opponent, Matt Rosendale, for moving to the state 16 years ago. A millionaire real estate developer from Maryland, where he made a lot of money turning farmland into developments. This has worked for Tester in the past. He's eked out slim victories twice now. There's not a lot of polling on this race yet, but it's expected to be tight yet again. And this year, the president's put a target on his back. I know things about Tester that I could say too. And if I said him, he'd never be elected again. The feud started when Tester publicized anonymous concerns about Ronnie Jackson, the White House doctor Trump had nominated to lead the VA. They called him the candy man. We're learning new details about the allegations against President Trump's nominee for Veterans Affairs Secretary. Jackson denied the allegations, but the negative press helped sink his nomination. I have a constitutional role uh, to uh, confirm nominees and vet those nominees. We had questions to ask uh, and we needed answers. Um, I put them out there because I knew they were gonna get asked in the committee meeting when he was under oath. Uh, and quite frankly, I thought he would be able to answer them. Had your office fully vetted all of the allegations that you re released? Uh, we had gotten similar allegations from many different points. We got 25 different folks that called us that were making the same allegation basically from different points of view. But you I didn't thought it was track important. Him down. Well, look, I mean, I, I think it was important to let him respond to him. Right. I mean, I think that was the best choice. I wasn't going to hire a private investigator right. and go down it. Well, I only you know. asked because the White House obviously did its own investigation and pushed back against some of the specifics. Well, just remember this: the Department of Defense Inspector General is now doing an investigation on Ronnie Jackson. After Jackson withdrew his name, Trump called for Tester's resignation. Do you think it's appropriate behavior for the president of the United States to call for a sitting senator to resign? He can do whatever he wants. I'm still a U.S. senator. That wasn't a no. You think that's appropriate? <laughs> uh, look, he's no. I, it wasn't a no because it's the truth. He's the president of the United States. He he can do whatever he wants. I, I don't believe he's above the law, but that's not a law-breaking crime. What he did. Do you trust President Trump? Um, yeah, I mean, if I didn't, we'd have a big problem. He's reversed his stance on health care, on DACA. He's been all over the place on, tr on trade. Do I think that he's been consistent with his perspective? No. So but how that's do you different trust him? than not trust him. How do you trust him then? I mean, the truth is when he came after me and Ronnie Jackson, he was straight up about it. He didn't so stab me in the back. he's going to attack me, at least he did he, it on he Twitter. He attacked me to my face. <laughs> I'm OK with that. This is how awkward it is to run for re-election as a red state Democrat. After Trump attacks you, you still have to defend him and hope that voters give you the benefit of the doubt. Why are you feeling confident about November? I'm not. Really? Uh, never feel confident. Uh, you're always you're always running uh, from behind. Uh, campaigns are, are a lot of work, and if you ever feel confident, you're going to lose. The Miss America pageant was founded in 1921 as a beauty contest with a risque twist, a swimsuit competition. 97 years later, the swimsuit is going away. And that means that we will no longer have a swimsuit competition, and that is official as of September 9th when we have our competition in Atlantic City. After a Me Too scandal, the Miss America board voted not to judge women in their swimwear starting with this fall's national competition. That makes the swimsuit contests in this summer's state competitions the last. My name is Alyssa Bopri, but I go by Allie. I started going by Allie when I graduated high school. Um, no specific reason, I just liked it because it was a little bit shorter and not seemed much of a mouthful. <laughs> The first time I saw a pageant would be on TV. I was actually watching the Miss America pageant. I think I was maybe 12. I would see the girls come back from competitions with trophies and crowns and sashes. And I was like, OK, I want to do that. I was really bad at ballet. And so after my mom, she was like, OK, you obviously don't like this. See, I could not focus at all. Um, she kind of stuck a baton in my hand and was like, all right, figure it out. 
Ali Bupri, Aggie Land. Last year was my first year, and I made finals. I was also People's Choice, which was really exciting. I did really well my first year, but I knew that if I could change my body and my fitness of how I viewed myself and how my confidence would be, I could do so much more. So this last year has been a lot of self-work. I took some time off from school. Um, I started doing personal training, all these fun things to help me. I say fun, sarcastic, but it is something that I needed to do for myself and it took me a long time to really um, accept who I am in the body that I've been given. I've lost 3% body fat, 29 pounds, and it's been incredible. It turned into, you know, it went from wanting to look good in a swimsuit to my fitness, my health, and my confidence that stems from all of this. And quite frankly, if you want to look good in a swimsuit, I don't feel any sympathy. Get in the gym and look good in a swimsuit. I don't think it was necessary because I feel they could have just let people like myself or people with similar stories, you know, kind of talk about what it's done for them and what it's supposed to be about. You know, swimsuit, people are like, oh, how's that going to help you in the real world? Your confidence. So like me, you know, now that I'm confident in myself, I walk into a room and I feel like I'm glowing. What these organizations stand for is to build us up and prepare us for life. And so I think that's definitely, you know, the main part of pageantry in you know, in our country. I joined the organization because um, I love the nostalgia of the Miss America system. You know, to me, I don't think the young ladies are being chosen on their swimsuit bodies per se. I don't think that's what the judges are actually looking for. I've had some experience as a judge. I've judged some other state pageants. And what I usually look for is usually above the neck. You've got to be so comfortable with your body no matter what, whether you're size two or size eight, you've got to be comfortable with who you are. The 2018 Miss Texas competition. They are focusing so much more on what's on the inside and what is in the girls' minds rather than just outward beauty. And I think that we are staying with the times, which is phenomenal. A newscaster does an interview in a bathing suit. So why in the world should Miss America? Ali Beaupre, College Station. This could be the last chance I ever get to walk on a stage in a swimsuit. It was something more personal for me than just going on stage in a swimsuit. It was showcasing all of my hard work and everything that I've done in this past year to grow in my fitness and my health. It's time for the announcement of the top 12 semifinalists. I went into it expecting, you know, to hear College Station when they called the finals and then didn't work out. Um, but from a personal standpoint, I improved by so much. Madison Fuller, the new Miss Texas, is actually one of my best friends. She is a fellow Aggie. I am loyal to this organization. It did so much more for me than just lifestyle fitness. It changed my life, and I owe this organization so much more than just continuing my year. Could you take the Drake photo for me? You want a Drake photo? Yes, please. Okay. Left hand here. All right. You're going to hold on to this. Okay. okay. Now position your body a little bit like this. Well, your hair is a little longer than uh, Drake's is, but that's True. okay. Should I take off okay. my glasses? Yes. Drake didn't have glasses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Know. Right. Point your head down in this direction. Okay. Look a little sad. There we go. We made it. Drake's fifth studio album was released on Friday. And by Sunday, it had already broken the record for most streams in a single week. But this is not Drake's most impressive number. In his hometown of Toronto, Drake's more than just a rapper. He's a walking economic stimulus package. I would say at least once a week, Probably tonight. I see an open table reservation with a personal note that says, can we have the Drake table, please? I want to thank everybody from the city for coming out tonight. Drake helped revive the mostly forgettable Toronto Raptors by becoming their hype man. When he came on also, it added that cool factor into it. It definitely rose ticket sales, it rose merch sales, and it rose the general feeling about the team, by far, clearly. It affected culture. The perception of Toronto by Torontonians is pre-Drake and post-Drake. It's a real thing. Everywhere Drake eats, grabs a mic, or shoots a music video has seen an impact. So have dozens of places he's probably never even been to. A while back, Drake popularized calling Toronto the 6 after the 416 area code. 
And ever since, Toronto's been swamped by six computer stores, six soul cycle classes, and even a six Indian food restaurant. I have to be honest, in terms of looking at Drake, he's done a lot more than I actually, even I had been aware of. Gordon Hendren does marketing consulting for major brands in Toronto. And he says the Drake brand is directly feeding into Toronto's $8.8 .8 billion tourism economy. How much is Drake's cosign worth to the city of Toronto, to the economy? We did some calculations uh, that suggest that he's worth about $440 million to the Toronto economy. $440 million. $440 million. There are a number of factors that go into that calculation, but we gave Drake 5% of that $8.8 .8 billion. Why? Because he's helped to rebrand the city. He's kind of made himself kind of the same as Toronto. Naturally, that's attracted the attention of Toronto's politicians. Councillor Norm Kelly has used the Drake effect to sell merchandise and make himself into an ironic internet celebrity. And I'm in Japan next week, actually, so I'm... And then there's Councillor Michael Thompson. He's responsible for attracting foreign investment into Toronto. Part of his strategy is traveling the world, trying to turn Drake cool points into Canadian dollar signs. I was just in New Orleans over the weekend, and um, the reason why I was there, we were there to secure a technology conference to come to Toronto for the next three years. And then I talked a little bit about Toronto, who we are, the number of people living here and so on. And when I mentioned this was home of Drake, the people just kind of went crazy. Just a mere mention of his name. And how much, how much money is this tech conference going to bring in? The tech conference will bring into the city of Toronto about $147 million. So you use Drake as a selling point to bring in over $100 million. I'm going to borrow, steal, and beg anything I can to help me to promote my city. The native son is here. He's got a great brand. I'm going to kind of hitch ourselves on it a little bit and get pulled up along the way, along with everything else that we're bringing forward, right? And it seems to be working. Vice News Tonight returns on Monday, July 9th.